Hello and welcome to today's webcast with Oz Design, where CEO Morten Henneveld and CFO Anders Svensson will present a report for the fourth quarter. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A, so if you have any questions, you can send them in in the form located to the right. And with that said, I hand over the word to you, Morten. Thank you very much, and welcome to this fourth quarter and full year 2022 webcast. My name is Morten Henneveld. I'm the CEO of Oz Design, and with me I have our CFO and the uh, Svensson. Morning. Today we want to walk you through our Q4 results and highlights of the quarter as well as the full year. The fourth quarter marked a very strong finish to a very successful year for Oz Design, demonstrating greater scalability and sustained high growth. To me, there are really four things that stand out as we conclude the year of 2022. We showed very significant sales acceleration in the business on both franchises and both geographies. We managed to build a new highly scalable growth leg in the company. We made solid progress on our mid to long term strategic investments and achieved several significant clinical milestones during the year. And last but not least, we also finished the year with a strengthening of the balance sheet. So in a market that remains suppressed with staff shortages, delays to hospital approval processes, and therefore is yet to return to pre-pandemic levels, we are very satisfied with the performance in the quarter and for the full year. As always, when we do these presentations, the normal disclaimer, What's also custom now, I do want to <clears throat> sorry, go back and talk about why we are really here and what we are trying to solve as a company, which is that today, current bone replacement products fail to heal a wide range of skeletal defects. For cranial, 10% or perhaps even more of implants end up becoming infected, of which many needs to be removed. And for spine and our bone graft product, one in five patients, patients do not achieve a so-called fusion. And ultimately for both patient groups, it means that many must undergo revision surgery, which is extremely painful for the patients, but also extremely costly to the healthcare system and therefore the society as such. If we move on to the fourth quarter, we made some very significant progress in the company again. We had another record-breaking quarter demonstrating above 100% global growth with an all-time high for both geographies and all-time high for both franchises. The US continued its strong performance with the third consecutive quarter of triple-digit exponential growth and came in at 162%. We also saw an exceptional strong comeback from the markets outside the US with 73% growth. We hit the milestone, the very important milestone of 500 patients treated with our Ostesign catalyst just as the year ended. On a more broad point, we had some very significant clinical and post-market publications on both our bone graft and cranial businesses. On bone graft, we reached more than 100 patients in our prepare registry, published the first post-market safety report, and we also had the first clinical publication just after the year ended. And for cranial, we published even more robust and better clinical evidence with updated post-market surveillance data, a key publication showing uh, cranial PSI being superior to PMMS, and we also had the largest case series in the US. And, not, and last but not least, we also strengthened the balance sheet at the end of the year with a highly successful directed share issue, bringing the company approximately 65 million SEC. And we are, of course, very pleased and thankful for the strong investor support that we saw. And with that, I'll now hand you over to Anders to walk you through the financial results before we go into uh, highlights of the quarter and the year uh, in, a, in a bit more detail. Over to you, Anders. Thank you, Morten. 
So if we turn to the results for the fourth quarter, we reported 19.9 million second sales, so very close to 20. That equals 117% growth, as Morton mentioned, for the quarter versus the same quarter last year. Uh, on a constant currency basis, that corresponds to 89% growth. Now, the fourth quarter was positively impacted by a couple of things. <clears throat> uh, we had some positive developments in cranial PSI manufacturing, which allowed us to ship early some of the products that were actually meant for January surgeries. And we also had an accelerated invoicing effect due to the extra days that follow on, a, on an annual close. These effects together was, were worth about 0.7 million sec. Now looking at the full year, <clears throat> we reported 57 million sec in sales, that's 80% growth versus 21, and 62% on a constant currency basis. And this is despite a continued, very challenging market that we operate in. Now the pandemic has caused fluctuations in sales all during 22, especially in the first quarter when we had Omicron. Um, we saw some slow uptake on elective surgeries in the second quarter, but the staff shortages and delays to hospital approval processes continue to remain a challenge for the healthcare system, even today and going forward. Uh, this, is, um, this leads to a continued depressed market very far from pre-pandemic levels, for sure. And as an example of this, we saw in December a spike in critical staffing levels and increased flu outbreaks, which led to a sudden retraction in the market that carried on into the beginning of 23. And as if that was not enough, we've seen, as you know, in 22, war, inflation, energy risk, and also interest rate risk that have now come up on our agenda. And with this backdrop, of course, we are extremely pleased that we managed these full year results. I also want to spend just a, a minute on the sales momentum. We can see in a very good accelerating sales momentum during 22. And if you look at this slide, you'll see we started the year in Q1, 7.1 million, and end up in Q4 on 19.9, .9, which is 182% higher within the year. Now, to me, this is a clear testimony to the underlying sustainability in the growth that we see. But uh, looking at where the sales is coming from then and the growth, you can see here that the US business accelerated again in Q4, 12 million second sales, continuing the strong momentum that we saw in the third quarter and um, came in at ex an exponential growth of 162% for the quarter, which means that we ended up with a full year growth in the US of 133%. This is now the third consecutive quarter where we had triple digit growth of around 150% in the US. And the share of our total revenues from the US increased to 60% compared to 50% in the same period last year. But um, Encouragingly, the markets outside the US also showed significant acceleration and sales amounted to about 17, sorry, 7.9 million sec in the fourth quarter. That's about 73% growth versus the same period last year. In early 22, we uh, restructured the sales force to provide an increased focus on Germany and France. And we are therefore very pleased to see a positive effect of these changes in the second half of the year, which means that we ended up with a full year growth of 38% outside the US. So all in all, a very strong quarter again and a fantastic full year. As usual, I wanna do a small deep dive into the US and just look at how US is not only taking off, but also showing sustainable growth. And what you see in this bar chart is the last 12 month rolling sales or LTM in each bar. And we started to see this trend in Q2, and now this has accelerated further in the fourth quarter. It also means that the last two quarters alone have contributed as much incremental sales in absolute terms as it took the company to reach in the first five years in the US, which clearly highlights the exponential momentum that we have in our US business right now. A very strong development, and we are really, really satisfied with it.
If we move on to the split by franchise, which we started reporting on last quarter, we continue to see a very healthy development in both businesses. And if we start with Cranial, we reported sales of 12.4 million sec in Q4 and accelerated that business even further. For the quarter, that 73% growth, which is a significant acceleration despite the very weak market that still suffers from a low level of electric procedures. Uh, the growth in Q4 also increased the full market growth that came in at 34%. And for our bone graft franchise, then we saw a further acceleration in momentum during the quarter as a result of more hospital approvals happening both during the third and also the fourth quarter. And whilst I would not pay too much attention to the growth numbers, as this is still within the first year of launch, reporting 7.5 million in sales during the quarter and 17 million for the first full year clearly indicate scalability and transformative potential that we have with Osteosign Catalyst. Now, global sales contribution by franchise, as you can see here, the strong Catalyst numbers also mean that bone graft again represented 38% of sales for the quarter, just as it did in Q3. And this means that it ends up representing 30% of global sales for the full year. That's a great result in the first full year. This means already in the first year that Ostesign Catalyst is now a very meaningful part of the business. And due to the higher gross margin, it positively impacts both profitability and cash flow. And I will now hand you back to Morton. We'll talk some to the other highlights and achievements we've seen. Thank you very much for that, uh, Anders. As I said in the beginning, during the quarter, we continue to make significant progress on our clinical programs. And I just want to highlight uh, the key, key ones. After the quarter ended, we announced that we now have treated more than 500 patients with Ostesign Catalyst. This is a great milestone to reach and resonates strongly with surgeons as broader usage mitigates risk concerns that any surgeon may have. It also clearly shows the high interest we have in the product. And in the extension of this, we also talked a little bit about it um, in the last quarterly report, we came out with the first post-market safety report on Ostesign Catalyst showing 0% device-related complication rate and therefore strongly supports the product safety profile. As I alluded to before, when you are launching a new product, surgeons will always ask about the safety of usage. And the results from the board is therefore something we're incredibly pleased with and means that surgeons who consider using our products are likely uh, to be more convinced about it, but it also resonates well with surgeons who are about to use it because it, minim it minimizes the risk concerns that they may have. So all in all, establishing a, a strong safety profile on the product is important when you're commercializing a medtech product. In the beginning of January, we also announced the first inpatient case report of Ostesign Catalyst showing complete spinal fusion six months post-surgery. The first case report from our top fusion study was published in the peer-reviewed biomedical journal of scientific and technical research. And although this report was based on observations in a single patient, the results are very encouraging with evidence of progression to fusion observed already at three months post-surgery with complete spinal fusion being achieved at six months. And this is accompanied by improvements in both pain and function outcome. So an outcome again, that we are extremely pleased with and which supports the preclinical data that we already had on Ostesign Catalyst. I also just quickly wanna remind everyone as we uh, announced uh, in Q4, we had an intention to launch a, our first line extension of Ostesign Catalyst with the one cc size. Um, that product has now been launched uh, in the US and, and whilst uh, revenue contribution of course would be lower due to the small size, 
the strategic importance of a full-size family is high and will enable improved access to the hospitals and surgeons. So those were some of the highlights on osteocyte catalyst. If we move in to, to cranial PSI, then I do want to bring your attention to a paper that was started. This is not uh, something that we press released uh, as it's done by one of our largest centers uh, in Germany, but it is the largest retrospective study to date on cranial PSI. The paper includes 82 patients over the course of seven years from uh, to, uh, 2015 to 2022 and aim to evaluate the feasibility and safety of a biocompatible calcium phosphate implants for cranioplasty compared to PMMA implants. And the clinical outcome is extremely possible, uh, sorry, positive and clear. And the authors conclude that a biocompatible calcium phosphate implant seems to be superior to a PMMA implant in terms of surgical side infection and post-operative complications. The absence of surgical side infection supports the idea of a biocompatible implant material with its ability for osseointegration. So the results, therefore, again, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to say, confirms the very unique properties of cranial PSI and adds, again, now in, even, in an even stronger format to the growing body of peer-reviewed clinical evidence. Osteocyte cranial PSI is clearly becoming well established in the orthopedic market with a continuously growing number of users and more and more robust data. In December, as we do once a year, we came out with updated post market surveillance data and now cover almost 2,000 implants. And it showed that the frequency of infections leading to implant removal was only 1.4%. The outcome here is better than what was observed in, observed in previous follow-up evaluations. And with the recent publications in general on cranial PSI, it now means that we have more than 10 peer-reviewed preclinical and clinical publications, and they are all consistently showing a strong clinical performance, as well as clearly proven rege regenerative capabilities. And combined with the solid post-market surveillance data, osteocyte cranial PSI therefore continues to manifest its very differentiated position in the treatment of cranial bone defects. As this report also covers the full year, I do want to take the opportunity to take a step back from the quarterly focus and look on the year that passed. Quite often we get preoccupied with what happens in a single quarter, but what's really important is that we show discipline and we execute well on our priorities over time, as this is what creates the building blocks for future growth. And 2022 was clearly marked by several very solid achievements, which also meant that we delivered on all the milestones that we communicated. If we start on the top with our bone graft business, the year was characterized by not only strong sales growth, but also some very big steps forward in our clinical programs. Early in the year, in January, we got the regulatory approval for our Propel registry soon after the first patient one was enrolled. And in November, we already reached the first 100 patients. For Top Fusion, we completed enrollment in April. And already in January of this year, we had our first patient report published in the peer review journal that we talked about a second ago. And in addition to these two main programs, we also established a US strategic advisory board with some very high profile key opinion leaders. We published our post market safety report and launched our first line extension. So as you can see, when we summarize the year, a lot of achievements in the first year of commercialization. Equally on our cranial business, we started with a big win in France of the largest and most prestigious uh, tender contract 
which was followed by the launch in Japan. And in the second part of the year, as we just uh, shared with you, we built even more clinical evidence with two key publications. And we wrapped up the year with now an even better and undisputable post-market surveillance data. So when I do the inventory check for the year, we are extremely pleased with the progress we made and we clearly ended the year in a much stronger place than we started. I also want to use this as a segue to take a step back again and relate our achievements to our strategy as N25 and the five key priorities in that. As you can see, the progress we've made in the company clearly follows the strategic priorities. We have delivered on the key promises in the strategy. We have improved value creation and we became a much stronger company with greater scalability. Our first priority is to win in the US. We focused a lot on the US and you, as you can see, we're delivering to that plan. The business has now been running in an exponential growth mode for several quarters. We have what we call LTM, so the rolling 12 month momentum is up nearly three times. And US now represents 60% of revenue, creating a much healthier mix effect in the business. And not least, the growth is sustainable with a broader customer base with more recurrent users. The second priority in the strategy was to build an alpha biologics business. As you've seen, we've demonstrated 17 million in sales in the first year, 500 patients treated, and the fact that we've attracted leading surgeons as ambassadors, all a testament to a very successful loans. That means that we are now well on the way and have set up the company for continued acceleration. On the third priority, which is to innovate the portfolio, as you know, new product development in the medtech field takes time. But we've already launched our first line extension with Catalyst 1TC and have line of sight to more products coming out in the coming years. Our fourth priority was to accelerate our clinical effort and to make some significant strategic investments in this area. And this was not only about doing more, but more importantly, fundamentally implement a new clinical agenda to do programs in the markets we operate in with our surgeons and with real patients. These are all key building blocks for the mid to long term and therefore takes time before we will be able to fully capitalize on it. However, with the things we've put in place in 2022 and the evidence we already published, we are clearly on the right track and we are very pleased, as we've said, with the progress and not least the many achievements within a relatively short period of time. The fifth and last priority we've not really talked so much about as this is the longer term play to change how we design, manufacture and ship our cranial implant, which requires a rethinking of many fundamental processes. At the end of 2021, we started a bigger project and during last year, we already delivered the first improvements in that plan, what we call phase one here. Phase one delivered a few days of improvements in the lead time, but at the same time, we laid out the plan for much more material reductions that we expect to see during 2023, which as you know, a shorter lead time means improved competitiveness and increased relevance for more cases. So as I said, when we summarize all this and how we've delivered to the strategy, I do believe that we've delivered on the key promises in the strategy. Um, and I do feel that we are a much stronger company with greater scalability as we come into 2023. So with that, I want to thank you for listening uh, and hand over to the operator for questions. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, the first question, how is onboarding of new hosp hosp hospitals for Catalyst going in the US? 
Well, I, I think the, the, the sales numbers uh, and the, the fact that we've now treated 500 patients speaks for itself. Uh, it is going well. Uh, we are building up that uh, customer base. Uh, we are seeing a, a high degree of recurrence uh, of the new users that are coming on board. As we've also said a number of times in these presentations, we do continue to see some real challenges uh, and delays to hospital approval processes. But uh, for now, I would say we manage it fairly, fairly well. And um, we're, certainly, we're certainly building a real business in the US and Catalyst. How is the VAC approval pipeline looking? Um, it looks good. As you know, we don't, uh, we don't disclose uh, 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 operational items like that. Uh, overall, I would say um, number speaks for itself. We are approved in numerous hospitals uh, already, and we have a pipeline to get approved it even more. So that is going absolutely on track. Thank you. What is the new reduced order to surgery lead time for the cranial product? Well, I think as, we, as, as we've said before, uh, it, typically uh, it takes uh, three to four weeks in Europe and four to five weeks uh, in the US. What we, what we saw during uh, the second half of the year here towards the end was uh, a few days of improvement, so nothing material. But I think more importantly, uh, we are working through a plan of a redesign of how we work and expect to start implementing that uh, during 2023. But we will keep you updated on that progression as well. Yes. Uh, when and in which form will the top fusion one year, year result be communicated to investors? Will it be some kind of early top line readout or will, it, will we have to wait for a scientific publication? No, I think uh, uh, it's still something that we, have, that we are debating in the company, as you know, um, this won't be a, a, a big statistically significant. We are talking 17 patients for 15 evaluable. Um, um, but so, but we will come out with something which is more of a, a for typical clinical paper. Uh, from a timing perspective, I think that is important to point out the uh, the last patient came in in April, so that patient will come up to to 12 months here in the second quarter. Um, as per the protocol, patients can come back in a 90-day window, so it means that the site is not likely to have all the data on all the patients until Q3, and then you need to extract that, get it uh, validated by third party, analyze it, and write. So I think everyone should expect that we are coming out with something in the beginning of 24. Does the recent announcement of 100 patients included in PROPO mean that you will consider these as a viable cohort to publish result on, on a one year, one year later? Yeah, uh, yes, in theory. Um, you know, I can't say if it's a viable cohort until I see that patients are also coming back at their one year checkup and we do get the images and the films that's needed. Uh, so it's a little bit premature to do that, but yes, the clear anticipation would propel is that um, is that as we are coming up to a meaningful cohort at one year, that that will also allow us to 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 uh, get publications out. Um, I do wanna wanna emphasize that even though it takes time to wait for the one year and the more clinical uh, publications, that doesn't mean that it's not adding value as we speak. You know, in tough fusion as we do in propel. We have real-time access to, to the data, to the surgeons who work with it, and to the images of patients. So this is, of course, something we are using actively on the NDA with surgeons to show uh, how our clinical data progresses uh, over time. So it, it does carry immense value as we speak to the commercialization effort. Uh, but I do understand the, the desire to also see the the more traditional clinical papers coming out, which, as I said, you should expect um, uh, in the early part of 24. Thanks. Uh, when you talk about exponential growth, do you mean quarter on quarter percentage or year or year on year? We're talking compared to the same period last year. Perfect. 
what I can see, that was the last question. So I want to thank you for the presentation and answering your questions today. And I want to thank all the viewers for tuning in. And have a good day. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.